Hello everybody and welcome to another film talk and this time I want to talk to you about the Ferrania P30 this beautiful film and the little bit the Ferrania history Before we begin, as usual, if you want to support the channel, please put a like, subscribe and share with your friends. If you want to go a step further, check out my books, the links is down there in the description. And there's photography, the F manual, everything you need to know about photography. Lasting Photograph is a novel with very good reviews, uh, with a photographic plot. And uh, uh, fine art inject printing, that is uh, everything you need to know to create uh, fine art with your inject printer, no matter if you start from uh, a negative, uh, uh, from a film, uh, scan a film, or with a digital file. This said, uh, let's talk about the Ferrania P30. And a little premise here, if you are interested just in my test of the film and you don't care about the history, uh, you can skip this video, I will put the timeline down there in the description. I think that uh, to understand the Ferrania P30, you need to understand the history. So, I decided to test the Ferrania P30 because uh, uh, I'm kind of uh, connected with the Ferrania, I have a lot of uh, negatives in my archive, my family archive, that were made by my parents, and uh, those are Ferrania uh, film. a lot of them are on Ferrania. And another thing is that uh, the Ferrania, that is a place where there was a factory, is uh, kind of 40-50 minutes from my house here in Italy, so uh, it's, I'm kind of connected. When I decided to test the Ferrania P30, I contacted uh, Ferrania to ask if it was possible to go to take pictures inside the old factory of Ferrania. Uh, they explained to me there was a kind of mess because uh, now there are uh, different owners and uh, a lot of these things are kind of locked down in a bureaucratic mess. So they suggested me something that was uh, kind of a very great experience because they told me to contact the Ferrania Film Museum and I discovered the existence of the Ferrania Film Museums that is in Cairo Montenotte, close to Ferrania and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful little museum. Uh, I went there and was a kind of very good experience. Uh, you can learn uh, everything about the history of Ferrania and most of all you can see uh, some of the tools and the proceedings that were used to create uh, the film. One of the organizers of the museum uh, is uh, Beckis, I think is the name, great guy that explains everything and is connected with the Ferrania history because already his grandfather was uh, working at the Ferrania. So it's really a nice experience where you see not just uh, the history of film, how the film was uh, built, and uh, but you also see uh, kind of the history of the people that surrounded Ferrania. So it's really, really an interesting experience. And you can uh, have a direct, uh, uh, you can kind of touch the history of the place. So that was really, really great. And I suggest you, if you are in Italy and if you can go in this area that is between uh, Piemonte and Liguria region, is uh, uh, very close to the Savona Arbor and uh, not far from Turin on the other side. So it's very, very, it's worth to go there and spend uh, some hours uh, exploring the museum. If we want to talk about the history of Ferrania, we have to go way back, and uh, I mean the late 1800s. In the late 1800s there was a company that opened in the area, uh, there was the SIPE, and the SIPE was the Società Italiana Prodotti Esplodenti, that means uh, Italian Society for Explosive Products. It was uh, a big company that produced explosives mostly for the Russian market before and then for the First World War. And that was the kind of the origin where everything began, because uh, uh, they produced explosives until the end of World War I. After World War I, uh, the company had uh, the similar destiny of a lot of other factories in Italy. Uh, they had uh, the ability to produce, but there was no more request uh, of what they produced. So they decided to convert the factory. And uh, one easy step, uh, was to go 
from uh, explosive to the substrate of film because at the time the substrate of film was nitrate cellulose and that was basically uh, just the explosive worked in a different way and if you remember uh, originally the film were very very flammable and that was by the way a huge problem because the projector has a very warm lamp uh, pointing on the film but uh, that was the that was the thing. So uh, the CIPA decided to uh, do a contract to, to bring in uh, the Pate. The Pate was a, a society in French, uh, the French company that produced films. So they brought in the Pate, and with the knowledge of the Pate for. Um, the production of uh, photographic material, uh, they started to work on that direction. So basically, the CIPE and they created the, what the company was called Film, F I L M, it was the Fabrica Italiana Laminati Milano. So it was the factory, Italian factory for laminates uh, Milan. And uh, Milan was in the name because the headquarters, the financial headquarters, was in Milan. So they started to study, and we are talking about uh, 1920, and uh, they started to study things, and they arrived to produce the first substrate in 1920, and uh, the first uh, photographic film in 1923. We have to uh, take a look at the wider history of Italy right now, because uh, 1922, was the march on Rome. So Mussolini marched on Rome and uh, got power in Italy. That was the official moment uh, of the birth of fascists. Also, if it was actually different because Mussolini was elected and uh, did some other things, but uh, the official moment that is remembered as the beginning of the fascist era was the march on Rome in 1922. Uh, everything started to change in Italy and uh, also uh, what was the perception of film and movies and so on. In 1924 the Istituto Luce was created and the Istituto Luce was l'Unione Cinema Educativo so it was the union for educational movies, educational cinema and that actually was uh, a, a huge um, propaganda machine. Mussolini as every dictator in uh, every time in history uh, did was to concentrate on the media. Uh, you, if you want to get power you need the media on your side. Uh, now the media are uh, social media, television and so on and we see that the power concentrate there but at the time uh, the real uh, media were the newspaper but they were just for an elite that was able to read and at the time was really an elite I mean I don't know if uh, in Italy 50% of the population was able to read so the other things that came out was the movie theaters and in the movie theaters was easy to do the propaganda so the Instituto Lucio was created and uh, it started to produce uh, uh, the news that they projected before the movies and all these kind of things. Mussolini also understood that the movie per se can be used as propaganda because you can uh, push uh, some narrative instead of others. Nothing different than what is done uh, right now. So uh, he decided to invest a lot in that direction. In Ferragna, uh, the Pate company in the 30 decided it was not uh, right for them to stay there. Uh, was probably the sales of the film didn't go so well, but I also think there was uh, uh, some pressure to uh, put out a foreign company and start to have something that was Italian owned. So in 1930, the Pate company went out and the Credit Italiano there was an Italian bank that had a lot of problems and was basically saved by the government. Um, and in fact, after became part, uh, um, became owned by the IRI, that was the Italian Reconstruction Institution. Uh, that was created uh, by the Mussolini government as a form of uh, not a statalization of companies, but yes, it was uh, to uh, 
kind of control the reconstruction and to found uh, some company, not others. So, uh, Iri bought Ferrania, the part of the Pate of Ferrania. And uh, uh, there was really, at the point, a very good moment for Ferrania. That was a great moment for Ferrania because the Iri decided to bring in uh, the Capelli Milano, there was a company producing film plates, uh, photographic plates. So, uh, the Capelli had a lot of experience in the emotion part uh, of, the, of the film. Uh, the Ferrania had uh, a very great uh, experience in producing and uh, abilities to produce the base of the film. They were really great couple together. When the Capelli company entered the, the, the film, that was the Ferrania, the name of Ferrania at the time, uh, Capelli plus film became the Capelli Ferrania and there started the name Ferrania. So as I said, uh, 1924 Instituto Luce, there was a lot that brought a lot of uh, money to the movie industry and everything started to grow. We arrive now in 1935 and there was another big change because the Society of Nations decided to sanction Italy. So in Italy it was not possible uh, anymore to buy things from outside and the sanctions as usual didn't work. It didn't work at all and had the contrary effect because uh, uh, the Mussolini regime was very good to convert uh, the sanction in uh, uh, proudness for Italian products. It uh, was very good to convert uh, a lot of factories and was very good to, uh, for example, they drained a lot of swamp and transformed that in productive land and so on. So it pushed the idea of autarky, the idea that Italy could produce everything without the help of a foreign country. and. Uh, as usual, uh, when there are sanctions, one of the first things that the dictatorship, the regime, try to keep is the power. And to keep the power, one of the most important is always communication. So, inv they invested a lot in the, uh, what was the movies, what was cinema. And uh, that arrived to 1937, that was uh, um, created Cinecittà. Cinecittà was the uh, Italian version in Rome of Hollywood and was really modern, really big, really great and they started to produce a lot, a lot of movies and that uh, obviously became a very good things for Ferrania that produced the film. There was no other producer of the film in Italy so Ferrania was the one and they really grew with that. We arrive in uh, 1942 that is already a war moment, is already pretty bad for Italy and still Cinecittà produced 120 movies in a year uh, and that was uh, the most film produced in Europe uh, at the time. So really really was uh, a growth and really uh, the regime was concentrated in keep uh, the movie industries. As they say you need to give to the people Panem et Circenses, so food and uh, fun and uh, the movie industries was that. It was so strong the movie industries that uh, in Ferrania they started to uh, work on a color film and uh, they brought uh, some uh, people from Agfa, the German factory, and uh, uh, they started to work on film. And this is another side effect uh, of the sanctions. Uh, before the sanctions uh, Italy and Germany were kind of allied but uh, in kind of uh, they stayed a little bit apart. There was uh, more competition between the two dictators than uh, there was alliance. 35 with the sanction Italy was forced to go closer to Germany and uh, the consequence were the Russian law that uh, Italy had to um, apply to satisfy Hitler so I was still able to have a commercial connection and this kind of things. So in this uh, commercial exchange uh, some uh, people from ACFA arrived in Ferrania and they started to work on a color field. Everything was going let's say good but uh, with the World War II and the developing of World War II everything obviously ended and also the production of movies was ended. At this point we arrive in 1945, what in Italy we call the liberation, so we feel good and we pretend that we were liberated and we were not on the wrong side of history and we rightfully lost. But uh, let's call it the liberation and uh, um, everything kind of restarted. Also in Ferrania 
the production restarted and also the research uh, for a color film still with uh, I think uh, the help of uh, someone from AGFA and you have to understand that at that point uh, Germany was completely destroyed so uh, in Ferrania they started to work again on the color film and they arrived to the production of the color film the Ferrania color and to do the first movie in color in Italy in 1952 there was uh, Toto Colori a movie that was a comedy with a comedian an Italian comedian so that was the thing uh, a lot of money arrived in the 50s uh, from the Marshall Plan, helps from the USA. Uh, there was the people who had really uh, the will to reconstruct, to regain freedom, to regain wealth and so on. So it was great moments for Italy. It was finally freedom, finally uh, the possibility to really create something. And uh, in this uh, scenario, also the movie industries started to grow. The movie industries was kind of peculiar because if you think that the Instituto Luce, the one for the propaganda created by Mussolini, was not dissolved, it was transformed, it was stayed there, uh, it was it's still there right now. So it was just, it just changed the side, but it remained uh, uh, as a kind of a propaganda machine, just what more, uh, different ideas uh, and the movie industry is the same it was it started to grow and it started to be uh, controlled by other sides so we have um, uh, a lot of uh, involvement uh, uh, still of politics in the movie industry so he had a big big push 50s and 60s were the top we had all the neorealistic movement uh, that was uh, really uh, good and it was uh, really powerful and went on producing a lot of movies and uh, we have names as Pier Paolo Pasolini, Rossellini and so on. 1958 uh, for Ferrania was another important step because this film here, the P30, the, the one that is written right now, was patented and uh, it was pushed out in the movie industries and uh, they start to use it. 1960 there was a movie La Ciucciara that uh, was with uh, Sofia Loren and uh, that movie got an Oscar, won an Oscar so uh, at that point uh, this uh, film uh, became uh, something that everybody wanted and was really particular because it had a specific look kind of high contrast, very deep black, a lot of uh, tonalities in the uh, middle region of the, of the exposure and that became the look of neorealism and still is now. So that was a really, really an important step. Uh, Ferrania grew a lot, uh, 50s, 60s, uh, we are uh, at the end of uh, 70s and so on. Um, a lot of uh, choices in the Italian industry were uh, wrongly made in that uh, in that period. I don't want here to go too long with the story. So uh, we arrived uh, at, at a certain point that uh, 3M, uh, the American company, bought Ferrari. They started to, uh, I think it was in the late 70s or 80s, they start to sell, yes, photography film, do these kind of things, but they concentrated also on other aspects of production like uh, tape and so on. Uh, at that point the things were uh, quite good but not that perfect and uh, we arrive at the 90s. And, and the 90s uh, was the moment with the digital revolution and all the film industries really got screwed. So in the 90s 3M decided to sell and there was a situation of different companies that got the places and uh, the main part of the factory and something was bought at the end by the Messina family to produce solar panel. And everything that is the Ferrania factory, General Ferrania factory is now there and uh, must be preserved because it's an historical uh, uh, important example of uh, industrial archaeology and these kind of things and this means that everything, everything is stuck down, is not worth to, to uh, reconvert the factories and all these kind of things so probably the destiny will, will be the same destiny that a lot of factories have that is 
collapse so finally can be destroyed and rebuilt without too much cost. This is the history of Ferrania and it was uh, there and was stopped there until uh, around 2010. Uh, around 2010 Nicola Baldini is the CEO of the new Ferrania, I suppose he is also the owner and uh, but I, i'm not sure about that and so they bought uh, uh, the ferrania patents they bought part of the ferrania and they bought what was the uh, part of uh, testing production so uh, it was not the main factory with all the production just the testing facility and the, the testing facility had all the machine to create film in a quantity that was uh, absolutely uh, not the quantity was needed at the time just to give you an idea 1933 uh, Ferrani produced 300,000 meter a day of film for sure now there's no need for all that so uh, they got the the prototype uh, facility and with that they can produce the film. They decided to produce the Ferrania P30 because it was a kind of a special film and it's different from the other film you see in the market. And here we arrive finally at the, my test of the Ferrania P30. As I said this film is uh, totally different from other films I tested. Uh, it has a lot of personality. This is a, a formulation that is a little bit different from other film and it has a lot of uh, silver in it. We are talking about 5 grams for square meter. The standard film is uh, kind of uh, half of that quantity. So it's a, an old formulation that is redone now. And uh, the look of this film is fantastic. But uh, I will show you now a little uh, slideshow with uh, with some of the pictures I took. Just uh, a little uh, premise. I did not retouch the pictures, uh, and I mean uh, I just adjust the labels and these kind of things. But uh, most of the pictures I didn't retouch the dust and the spot, and that because uh, two reasons. The first one, uh, it's a lot of work to retouch uh, every spot for every frame. Also, if I don't print them, so. Uh, that's uh, sometimes not worth. But second, I want to show you a little problem I had with this film. That is, uh, it seems to attract the dust, uh, the dust in the atmosphere, so electrostatic, and the dust uh, in like the residue of the water, the washing waters, uh, more than other films. So I just want to show you this slideshow. Uh, please don't concentrate just on the dust, but look at the beauty of the film. And after, I will talk to you about the film.
As I said, it's a beautiful, beautiful film. Uh, the tonalities in the middle region are fantastic. The dark are very dark with uh, some details still, and the highlight again became very, very bright, but with still some details. So uh, it's a very, very nice film to use. And as a that particular look, that is the neorealistic look, and we can see in the movies that were produced in the 60s in Italy. So if you want a film that gives you something uh, a little bit uh, special, a different, uh, a different view, this is perfect. And uh, if you compare it with the normal films, there's a difference. You see the personality. Uh, I tried uh, three roles of this film, three different situations, and uh, um, I want to keep the fourth role I bought for. I want to keep the fourth and try it in portraits uh, that is in the styles as the 40s and so on. What I want to say here, the images are all taken with the Pentax MZS, this beautiful camera with different lenses, some vintage lenses and some modern lenses that I'm uh, testing right now. So uh, it was kind of uh, a fun experience. And uh, every time I say I use this camera uh, mostly for one reason, that is the ability of the camera to print uh, on the border of the negative to print some uh, information uh, about uh, the shooting. So that's something that I really like. I really enjoy the rest with this film. Uh, the first role I developed following the suggestion for, from a friend, I developed in Infotech HC One Plus 47. So with a very, very much diluted. And the idea was to keep the contrast down. Uh, I look at the results, uh, it was a kind of of uh, underdeveloped in my opinion. So uh, next step, next role, I used the Ilfotec HC at one plus 31 and it was, they came out really, really great. And for the third role, I want to uh, follow one of the suggestions uh, from uh, Ferrania and something that uh, I think is very nice. And I used Rodinal and uh, I followed the instruction on uh, Ferrania website and it came out really, really great. The film is uh, not easy to use at all. It's a very precise film, so uh, you must be precise when you take the pictures. It's not something that you can put in the camera, just don't care. Uh, it's not the kind of role that you go around with the uh, camera without the exposure meter and think, yeah, just sunny 16 and so on. Uh, it's a very precise film and the exposure must be very good. Uh, it is an 80 ISO film. I prefer to expose it to 64, perhaps 50, and eventually shorten a bit the developer to uh, keep the contrast. But uh, uh, it's uh, it can be used in IT, ISO and it's a nice, nice uh, film. Uh, be very careful for the shadows. Uh, you really need to keep the shadows in the right uh, exposure zone uh, to not lose detail. So it's not not an easy film, but it's absolutely wonderful the results that you can have. As I said, very high contrast for uh, some situation is really a plus, is really beautiful, for other situation can be a problem. So you need to know what you are shooting with this film. The downside, as I told you before, the downside of this film is one, I don't know why it attracts a lot, so much uh, dust uh, from the atmosphere and uh, um, from the water. Uh, I did uh, the same day, uh, same moment, basically, just after that I developed other film and I did not have uh, all the dust on the film. You must be very careful with this film for the dust and another thing is very delicate. Uh, what I noticed is uh, a lot of uh, scratches going around. Uh, if you manipulate the film a little bit more it's very easy to scratch. So that's something that is uh, I hope to see it uh, a little bit uh, stronger as an emulsion in the future release. Another thing of the scene that I would love to see improved is uh, the, the printing and the numbers of the film are barely perceivable. Uh, they need to print that uh, in the right way, not because I need the numbers and so on. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to have them, but uh, uh, that's not the important part to have the numbers on, on the things, but uh, it's very important to have uh, the printing on the negative to uh, 
evaluate if uh, the development, for example. I use the, the numbers and so on to evaluate if uh, how much I developed the film, if it was overdeveloped, underdeveloped and so on. It's a good uh, referral point uh, for a fully exposed uh, part of the film. I would love to see the numbers and the Ferrania brand and so on made uh, printed in the right way on the film. It's a little detail, but uh, uh, I found difficult to the first role to evaluate my development without knowing the film and uh, without uh, the, the, the writing there. Good things, I used the MZS, so I had the printing from the camera that I was sure were fully exposed, so I had that as a comparison. Obviously, fantastic film. Uh, it's a fantastic film that I would love to see it in a medium format, so 120 or even in a large format. It's really a peculiar film and when I want to do something that is a little bit more organized and special, as it is required with this film, I think, uh, I prefer to use medium or large format and I would love to see this film in that format. So this said, this is a fantastic film, they did a great job to bring back that uh, look, that neorealistic look uh, with this emulsion and I really wish to Nicola Baldini and uh, all the team in Ferrania, uh, really I wish them good luck and uh, I hope they will be able to start the production of this uh, in uh, more formats and go on with this project because uh, really is uh, very nice to have something that is uh, different on the market. So, great job, Ferrania. Really, uh, was fantastic film. I really enjoyed the test. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Also, the part about the history. Or if not, you skip and don't uh, just curse against me because I stayed too long on the history. So, thank you very much for watching. Uh, please, again, if you want to support the channel, put a like, subscribe, share with your friends, and check out my books. Lasting photographs, a novel, photography, the manual, and fine art in print. Thank you very much for watching again, and see you next time with another film.